So Marcus, your new book is entitled Co-Managing International Crises, Judgments and Justifications. This term co-management is unusual. What do you mean by it? Um, I just looked at the world around us a bit and uh, I found it striking that most crises uh, in the last decades, but even before, are usually managed not by one state alone, but by several of them. And sometimes uh, they succeed in doing so, sometimes they succeed in managing crises together, and other times they fail. And uh, I was interested into the causes of that, so under what conditions do crisis, does crisis management, managing crisis together succeed and under what conditions does it fail? And then I looked at literature actually on environmental politics and, 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 hell, and, and, and trying to, to uh, counter natural disasters and they sometimes use this term co-management. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in order to convey that message, I'm really interested in how states manage crises together. I opted for that term. So you use these two th terms throughout uh, judgment and justification. How do those function? How does that fit into your explanatory framework that you're offering in the book? Yeah, so my, my starting assumption basically was that if we look at international crises, um, leaders are very important. So I really have to be able to say something about ultimately the big philosophical question about rationality. How do leaders come to make up their mind? Um, but then I don't think that it's just leaders making up their minds by themselves. Um, they are actually experiencing all kinds of influences. And that is where the justification comes in. So, so uh, the book outlines a theoretical framework where judgment of leaders uh, is very important. Um, but that judgment actually starts as pre-judgment, so as a first hunch. And then uh, this first hunch is pushed and shoved into shape through justificatory encounters. So could you give us an example, something that you found particularly interesting or surprising or shocking um, just to introduce readers to the arguments that you're offering in the book. I mean, shocking. I like the I like the the, yeah. the, the, the question about about shocking. Um, we oftentimes think that uh, the leaders are these kind of computational geniuses who calculate costs and benefits very carefully and everything. And I do maintain in the book that they try to do so, uh, but uh, very rarely do they actually succeed in in doing so. Um, they're usually guided by certain big ideas that they have on their minds. Um, these big ideas at times may sound at first glance uh, very benevolent. Um, so Blair, for instance, throughout the crises that are, that are analyzed, um, converged more and more around this idea of humanitarian intervention, uh, liberal interventionism, and that on the face of it is, doesn't look all that, that bad. Yeah? So it's uh, basically, okay, uh, sovereignty is not the right to do wrong within your own boundaries. But obviously how it plays out intermingled very much with, uh, with power politics. Um, that's when the, when, the, when the problems begin. And let's say if we stick with, with Blair, then his decision making over time becomes more and more insular. So uh, he sidelines members of cabinet uh, more and more and then basically more and more runs his own show. And this is where the decision making pathologies in. So, so a term that comes to mind immediately is groupthink. Mm -hmm. So that I expose my, uh, my ideas for making decisions only to a very limited number of like-minded people and in that way decision making becomes very problematic because there are no checks and balances on, that, on, this, on, on making decisions anymore. So that's really interesting. I think it can shed light on some of the major crises that nations have faced in recent years. So if you were to give readers, say, three key takeaways from the book, what is it that you think uh, will most be beneficial for readers in understanding uh, this concept that you put forward? I think that in the book there are basically three major contributions. I think the, the, the first one is on studying uh, how, how states manage crises together and the, and, the, and the causes, what makes it possible, what makes it impossible. Um, and they, I really think it is very important to look at judgments and justifications. I think that's, a, that's the first big contribution. The second um, point that's important for me is that uh, if we think about Europe and uh, the three crisis core managers that I look at, 
uh, um, Britain, France and Germany. Um, if, we, if we look at Europe, if it wants to assert itself in international affairs and in parentheses even after Brexit, I think these three are going to be uh, very important. Um, then it's very important for us to look at something that is some, sometimes referred to as strategic culture. So there is a repertoire of ideas that people take for granted. If this repertoire of ideas uh, varies very, very significantly across states, uh, which is the case when it comes to those three states, it's very difficult to get judgments that are in sync with one another across leaders. And it's also very difficult to get the kind of justificatory pressures that you need in order uh, to get good decision making, in order to get a decision making that moves towards crisis co-management. And, um, and I think the third one is, is, uh, is uh, something that is more for, for, for theory-minded uh, scholars, but I think it's important too. If we think about how leaders make up their minds, uh, how do they actually figure out what to do, then it's not this, this computational genius model. Uh, but it is political judgment, and that's a, that's a term that's actually fairly loose, comes uh, from Immanuel Kant, and then uh, later on with a bit of a tif different twist that I, that I take um, by Hannah Arendt, and it's subsuming particulars under universals. So that means I always have this big idea on my mind, and uh, that's the universal, for me it's the universal. And then I find something in the social world, in the real world, that I want to make intelligible of, and I make intelligible of that uh, through the lens of this universal. Um, so, for instance, uh, analogies are very important. So, say, the, the, the Munich analogy uh, comes up in my book over and over again, yeah? Mm -hmm. Never to appease a dangerous dictator again. That obviously is a very important lesson in, in diplomacy. There's no question about that. Great, thank you so much. If I may ask you just one more question. Do you see in the present a kind of fracturing of these models of, um, you mentioned you know, rational decision making, assuming that, that leaders are trying to be rational and trying to make the best decisions. We see more and more sort of oddball leaders coming to power, a person like Trump, for example. Is the model that you put forward at all applicable to someone like him? Is this going to help us to understand these sort of strange figures who've come into power in uh, this portion of the 21st century? Yeah, I think it's very applicable. Um, so if we think of someone like Trump, then uh, what are actually, what is the repertoire of ideas that is important for him? Well, he worked as a businessman in New York real estate. Um, so therefore he looks at the world in certain ways, say uh, um, economics is in a zero-sum game. Um, always just wanting to be in a position of strength uh, uh, not very attuned to compromise, so this is really something that comes out of his prior career and that I think informs his judgments. If we think about uh, justificatory encounters, uh, then he has a lot of, fairly one-sided, justificatory encounters with the public. Yeah? So foreign policy uh, therefore has then really a lot to do with, with trying to serve one's constituents. So it's really very, very strongly uh, public rule as opposed to private. Uh, so there's really no balance between the two of them anymore. And, uh, and if we think then about, uh, about uh, decision making, I think then, then uh, with regard to Iran, I think if we, if we, look, if we look at, at uh, North Korea, then, then a little bit of that is visible already again. So I think there's, there's quite a bit of, of uh, applicability. Um, the fracturing in the world in general, oh yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's definitely something we experience. I mean, my book starts in the 1990s, um, now uh, 20 years later, it ends with, with Iraq, but now then from Iraq 10 years later or more. Um, there's, we do live in a, in a much more fractured world in which crisis management has become even more difficult. Um, but I think it has become, precisely because of that, also even more important. So if we want to deal uh, with the kind of uh, international crises that we face in our days and that we are very likely to face in the, in the not that far future, I think, then this crisis commandment is definitely something that's going to stay on the agenda. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure.